September 25th, 2017. This is CISB 113, Section 7. Today is day number 11, week number 6. So let's get started. Welcome back to today's class. It's going to be very exciting to see you back here. You are no. uh, May I have your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen? First of all, let's get back to this, all right? This is our environment. And so let's switch to the submission link. The submission link, um, are you fully aware of the submission link? You finish submitting your first journal, okay? By 11.55 yesterday. And let's take a look at this. In this class, we have 74 students. And so far, we have 63 students who submit the work. In other words, 11 of you did not submit the work. Okay? 11 of you did not submit the work. So, I'm going to walk through. I'm going to walk through the submission pages. So, if you happen to be, may I give your attention, please? If you happen to be the student who have not submitted your work, I will give you the one last chance, okay? I do not want you to lose your score. Okay, let's go into the submission page. All right. This is a very good submission. The name is correct following the naming conventions, okay? This is a technically different submission. When you see the extension sign like this, so we see that you add something here with no intelligible regions. You should follow the format of the name conventions. You should not have DOC item 2 here. Okay? So I will give you a chance to resubmit the file with the correct name. And then David submitted 36 minutes and 49 seconds late, but with the proper name of the file. That's good. And Marina, you did not submit your file, Marina, are you here? Okay. So if you see that you have not submitted your file here, I will give you one last chance after walking through all of these. But you are not going to submit it here, you're going to submit it in the and then Jason did not follow the naming conventions because he did not follow the naming convention as expected. So he need to resubmit the file with the correct name. And look at that. This one, Celia, again you did not follow the naming conventions. You need to follow the naming conventions for submissions. Okay, and then Tony, very good. Miko, you did not follow the naming conventions in your submissions. You must follow the naming conventions. Okay, all right. And then Lakita, you also need to follow the naming conventions. Okay, you did not follow the naming conventions. Okay. Alright. You need to change back the name. The name following the naming conventions. Okay? Yes, you need to study the naming conventions. Okay, in the submission page. Alright, so in a second. So pointing, are you here? Okay, you need to submit your work, alright? I'll give you one more chance to do it before 11.55 tonight. Alright, okay? And then eyes, you need to submit your file again with the correct name. Eyes, make sure you're not following the naming conventions. And then this is Bobby, it's okay. Uh, and then Ella. Ella, you need to submit the file. Not without the F. Uh, Alan, are you here? You need to change it back to the DOC or DOCX. Okay, and then you need to follow the naming conventions. You 
don't something fine with this name. We have a naming convention. I'll give you a chance to do it, don't worry. No penalty. And then, again, happy, you need to follow the naming conventions. Happy, are you here? Happy? Okay, you need to follow the naming convention. This is not the correct name, alright? So you need to read the submission guideline. Okay? So then something like this. Okay? General. But this is also not correct because this chairing did not include your student number. You need to include a student number, okay? Now this is okay. But with this Tira, you do not need to have an extra dot DOC, alright? Tira, are you here? Okay, you need to make sure. You write to have a dot DOC, which is the 97 versions, or a dot DOCX. So this is not the name expected. Don't worry, just submit it again with the form in a minute, I'm going to tell you. Alright, so this is correct, this is the naming convention expected. This is also the naming convention expected. This is also correct. Okay, page number three. So now this is not the naming convention expected. Drew, Drew, right here. Okay, you need to follow the naming conventions. All right, change it back. Resubmit it in the forum. So Neil Wong, you have done it right. I think you have done it right, Neil. But except for this dot DOC. You need to make sure you why they use the Microsoft version, old versions, you've got dot DOC, new versions, you've got a dot DOC alright? So this is correct. Judy, you need to change the name. Judy, are you here? Judy, okay, you need to change the name, alright? Follow the naming conventions. <coughs> Pinky, you also need to change the name, alright? Follow the naming conventions. Alisa, you need to change the name. And then you must provide a .doc or .doc, not the dot .pages. The dot .pages are on my Mac computer, dot .pages. You must convert it to dot .doc or dot .doc, okay? I can't read this, all right? Make sure you follow the conventions. And then this is again not DOC, not DOCX. You have to change it back. All right, Sandy, it's okay. And Gummy, it's uh, Gummy. You need to change it back. You cannot just say Universal Macau dot DOCX. Gummy, are you here? Okay, make sure you follow the naming conventions. And again, Wing Chen, you need to change it to the naming conventions expected. You need to make sure you follow the rules. Okay. Alright, so this, again, you have to change it. Rain, are you here, Rain? Rain? Okay, you need to change back to the name of the events you expected. Helen, are you here, Helen? Helen? You're not here, okay? The name? The name? You need to, you need to submit five before the end of today, okay? I'll tell you when to submit it in a minute. Ruby is okay, and uh, Sabrina? Is not okay, Anthony, you need to change the name, Anthony, alright? And then Buki, you need to change the name again. Uh, T Yun. T, you need to submit the file before the end of the day, okay? No penalty. If you submit it beyond the day, you'll be penalized, okay? And then uh, Kathy, you need to change the name again. Kathy, are you here? Okay, good. And then Bofa, Bofa are you here? You need to change the name, okay? And then page five. Page five, okay. Oliver, Oliver, you need to change the name again. Uh, Rahana, 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 you need to change the name anyway. Jerry C, you need to change the name, Jerry. All right, Jerry, are you here? Cherry C, not here today. Cherry, not here. Okay. And then Mengin, Mengin, are you here today? 
Okay, you need to submit a file before the end of the day, okay? Otherwise you will be penalized. Snanny, Snanny, okay, you need to change the name. This is not following the naming conventions. And then Fry I, Fry, you need to change the name, okay? Uh, wait, Tom, you're doing a good job here. Yeah? And then Coco, Coco, you need to change the name, okay? And then Logan, Logan, you also need to change the name. Uh, here, thank you, you need to change the name, <coughs> all right? So don't commit silly mistake, otherwise you will not have the score. Okay, T, T, Ling, T, Ling, you need to change the name, okay? Bobo, you're doing a good job, I think. Bobo, are you here? Yes, your name is correct, you need to follow it. Everybody needs to follow naming conventions like this. Wing Yang, Wing Yang, you need to change the name, okay? And then Kelly Ho, you're doing a good job here. Kelly, are you here? Thank you. Uh, and then Gang Ying, Gang Ying. Yanni, not here today, okay? Stephen Chern, Stephen, you need to change the name, okay? Make sure you study the naming conventions. Kaiyu, you need to submit it before the end of today, okay? Angel, you're doing a good job here, except for .doc, .docx. Angel, are you here? Angel, Angel, are you okay, not here? Asuri, okay, you're doing a good job here. Uh, Susie, you're doing a good job. And then page seven. All right, nine, nine. You need to submit before the end of the day. All right. And Sylvia, you're doing a good job. Uh, Whitney, you're doing a good job. Whitney, thank you. And then Genius, Genius, you need to change. Not dot D O C not okay, you need to change it. You just have to say after or worse, something like this, even worse or without this. Okay? Alright? So keep uh, notes. Keep notes, okay? And then uh if not, you need to change your name. Make sure you change the name, okay? You you name. Thank you, you do a good job, thank you. Rules, you need to submit it before the end of the day, okay? Minty, you're doing a good job except for dot DOC and dot DOC. Minty, are you here? Okay, right, thank you. Say under the old versions you got this. Say under the new versions you got this, okay? Do not put dot DOC, okay? Ho Yi, you need to change the name Ho Yi. Ho Yi, thank you. Thank you. Jamie, you're doing a good job, Jamie. Good job. So, page number eight. Okay, Fred, we need to submit it before the end of the day. Fred, are you here? Okay. Yuki, you're doing a good job. Eric, you're doing a good job, except for the dot DOC, dot DOCX. Okay? So, Paolo. Okay, you're doing a good job. Ask me, you need to change the name. Alright, and then Amelia, you're doing fine, everything is okay. Thank you, Amelia. And then now, if you need to resubmit your file, okay, listen very carefully. If you need to resubmit your file, or it's your first time to submit your work, you need to come here in week number six under the public online discussion forum, I have sent a link called resubmissions of your LC001 journal. When you click into this, what you need to do is to make sure you follow the naming conventions here. Actually, this is to be 07. Okay? 07. Alright, that's right. And then what you need to do is to 
press the button Reply. Okay, when you press the button Reply, you just have to drag the file into this box here, and then I will see it. Drag your renew the file, correct name, into this box, and you press Post. By doing that, I will see that you submit the file. Okay, the correct one. You do not need to do any change on the original submitted versions. Okay, then you do not need to save a lot. Of, you do not need to spend extra time there. I will check right here. So make sure you do that. Now, actually, I'm quite satisfied. Out of a class of 74 students, we got uh, 63 students who submit your work by the deadline. Okay. And then we give you one more day to collect the missing links, those 11 students. So it should be enough, all right? So the purpose is to make sure you will have a chance to do something right, okay? So now let's go back to week number six. Actually, this is the second week of the learning contract. We start learning contract number two last week. And we introduced to you uh, last week the meetings of collaborative learning. And so I would like to make sure you do not forget it first, because in the second learning contract, you need to work very hard with your learning partner conscientiously. So collaborative learning is very important. Now, so allow me to make sure you understand in two minutes and 44 seconds. This is a review by a very good educator. Collaborative learning in the classroom works when you have group goals, so you have students working as a group rather than just working in a group, and in the accountability. So that every single student is individually accountable as well as collectively accountable, so you can't have passengers. And there are many ways in which teachers can set up those two conditions. But if you can establish group goals with individual accountability, then the research evidence suggests that you can. In the second learning contract, you need to work in a pair, which is a group of two persons. You need to work with your learning partner. Remember last week I gave you an informal assignment, which is for the two of you in your pair to explore the usage of the Microsoft Word PowerPoint. And on the Microsoft Word PowerPoint, you try to learn the IT skills of recording your voice over the individual slide. And then I invite you to learn how to convert your PowerPoint with voice over individual slide into a video file, such as MPEG-4 or AVI, so that you can bring your presentations wherever you go in the form of a video slide. And this is something you need to connect with your learning partner to start doing it. It's a collaborative work. Today, I helped you to reinforce the concept of collaborations, collaborative learning, by introducing to you a two minute and 44 seconds review from Dean Williams, a very influential educator. Approximately double the speed of student learning. When you create a community of learners, when you create a group of people who meet collectively and share goals to help each other master something, something rather magical, you actually get a higher level of achievement, greater sustained engagement than you can in Canada Europe. And the school students and the teachers are collectively engaged, collectively participating in this joint venture of helping everybody grow. Um, and of course, then you have all the consequences of that. So teachers will still be learners as well as, as teachers. Students will be teachers as well as learners. So blurring those roles, shared roles, uh, mutual respect, uh, value each other, person as an individual, and helping them achieve, achieve the, the most they can. Okay, before we end the script, I would like you to spend two to three minutes now sharing in your table about your work with your learning partner. Definitely assume you're already sitting next to your learning partner to just share how much have you picked up from last week's work using the Microsoft PowerPoint 
exporting, how you can record your voice over the slides. If you are ever export that, if you have not done this, ask a table member of your table to see how many of them have already acquired the skills. Okay? Two to three minutes only. Just get your information. Who did that? Who had the experience of doing that? Okay, two to three minutes. Talk to your table members. It's very important for you to ask the resources of all table. Important. If you know how to make the best use of the resources at your table, you are quite well set. Okay? Never just sit there alone. This is a class where you will learn together. I just give you two to three minutes.
So, at the last week, we helped you to understand the meaning of the well. So, but we did not actually uh, tell you the, the components of the web or the, the ideas of how the web comes from. So, this week, we need to make sure that you will be given this piece of information. So, so ladies and gentlemen, give me three minutes. Okay? Have you ever wondered, when you visit a website, where those words and images come from? This is the World Wide Web in plain English. These days, as long as we have an internet connection, using the web is pretty easy. We can visit billions of pages on things from pet alligators to the weather in Holland. To help figure out how it works, let's pretend we can get really small, follow the wires, and explore what makes the web work. In order to get to the web, we need a connection from our home or business to the rest of the online world. This usually happens through the phone or cable lines, or even satellite. This connection means that information from around the world can reach our computers. If we could see the connection, the information coming through it would look like little packets of code. It doesn't make sense to most people. We need a translator something that turns the packets of code into words and images we see on a website. For this, we use a web browser. It translates the information and makes it useful to us. But that code has to come from somewhere, right? Right. If we could follow it to its home, we'd see that it's coming from another computer. Not a regular computer, but one that's built to make web pages available. It's called a server. The words and images that appear on our screen live here in the server. If there was only one server, this would be simple. But there are millions of servers and web pages. We need a way to find a specific page on a specific server. We do this with web addresses. Each server and website has a unique one. As long as we have the right web address, we can visit a page on any server on the web. The reason we call it a web is that all the servers are connected. We can easily jump from one to the other using addresses via our web browser. And we don't have to remember all the addresses. Web pages use shortcuts or links, words and images we can click that direct us to page after page. These links create a web of connections that are easy to navigate. Together, this system makes up the World Wide Web. Wow. So, let's sum it up. To visit a website, we type in a web address or click a link. The information for the website lives on a server. It comes to us as little packets of code, and our web browser translates this code into words, photos, music, videos, and links that help us get things done. Yay! I'm Lee Lefevre, and this has been the World Wide Web in plain English. So, with this video, you could have some intuitions, or better say, intuitive understanding of why we call it a web, a web of servers. But what about the intellect? Okay, what about the intellect? So let's try to see if we understand something about the intellect. Okay, we've got something here. So, how does the internet work? Most of us know how to use the internet without actually understanding how it works. Sort of like electricity in your home. You use it every day, but may not understand the mechanics behind it. And if the electric grid is difficult to understand, then the internet must be impossible, right? Wrong. In the next few minutes, I'll put you in the top 10% of people who understand how the internet actually works. For securitycatalyst.com, I'm Aaron Titus. Whenever most people think of the internet, this is what comes to mind. The internet is not a bubble cloud, even in the new age of cloud computing. The whole fuzzy cloud picture was created by people more concerned about job security than education. This is the internet. Wow. The internet is a wire, actually buried in the ground. It might be fiber optics, copper, or occasionally beamed to satellites or through cell phone networks. But the internet is simply a wire. The internet is useful because two computers connected directly to this wire can communicate. A server is a special computer connected directly to the internet, and web pages are files on that server's hard drive. Every server has a unique internet protocol address, or IP address. Just like a postal address, 
IP addresses help computers find each other. But since 72.14.205.100 doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, we also give them names like Google.com, Facebook.com, or SecurityCatalyst.com. So this is how it works. Your computer at home is not a server because it's not connected directly to the internet. Computers you and I use every day are called clients because they're connected indirectly to the internet through an internet service provider. May I ask you, what internet service provider we have in Macau? Do we have an internet service provider? Do you enjoy the fiber optics internet connections at home? Which company provide that connection to you? CTM, right? So CTM is basically an ISP in Macau, an internet service provider. Guess what? Before CTM provides such service to the people in Macau, it is the University of Macau who provide this service to CTM. It's only after five years of tried and development that we send the package to CTM. Okay. That is very interesting in the history of the internet development in Macau. Here we'll pretend that this is my home laptop and I'm using DSL. Now let's pretend that I want to visit AOL.com, which is coincidentally both a server and an ISP. I hop onto my laptop with DSL, go through my ISP, onto the internet, and look at AOL.com. My computer connects with AOL.com, and I can look at its web pages. Now, let's say that I want to send an email to Aunt Ruth. Aunt Ruth has AOL dial-up from home, and I've got a Gmail account. I log on to gmail.com and compose a message to Aunt Ruth's email address, Ruth at aol.com. Once I click send, gmail.com sends the email to aol.com. The next day, Aunt Ruth dials into AOL servers and retrieves the email. Whenever an email, picture, or web page travels across the internet, computers break the information into smaller pieces called packets. When information reaches its destination, the packets are reassembled in their original order to make a picture, email, web page, or tweet. Wow. Okay, so imagine you're at work sitting next to your boss, and you're both surfing online. Your boss is doing market research, and you're updating your Facebook profile. You're both sending packets back and forth over the internet. But what's to keep your packets from accidentally ending up on your boss's screen? That could be embarrassing. The solution to that problem is IP addresses and routers. Everything connected directly or indirectly to the internet has an IP address. Everything. That includes your computer, servers, cell phones, and all of the equipment in between. Anywhere two or more parts of the internet intersect, there's a piece of equipment called a router. Routers direct your packets around the internet, helping each packet get one step closer to its destination. Every time you visit a website, upwards of 10 to 15 routers may help your packets find their way to and from your computer. Imagine each packet as a piece of candy wrapped in several layers. The first layer is your computer's IP address. Your computer sends the packet to the first router, which adds its own IP address. Each time the packet reaches a new router, another layer is added until it reaches the server. Then, when the server sends back information, it creates packets with an identical wrapping. As the packet makes its way over the internet back to your computer, each router unwraps a layer to discover where to send the packet next until it reaches your computer and not your boss's. And that's how the internet works, in five minutes or less. And you're now easily in the top 10% of people who understand the basics of the internet. Do you observe the software here when he tried to explain something to it about using the idea of rock candy? Okay, rock candy here. There is a small box here which said, no, the rock candy analogy is incorrect because each IP address here, each IP address here is directly addressable, could be used alone to send it to the direct destination. So any router can direct your package to any other part of the internet. Okay? At the very beginning they use the rocket concept it's being carried and the address in the very first layer and it's 
not correct, okay? So there is a annotations to make it correct, erect, we call it. Okay, having said that, now I hope with this two video, we try to tie things together. That's a last week study on what? Last week we studied something called the evolutions of the web, explaining web 2.0, the blocks and frame angles, the wikis and frame angles. The blocks, somewhat like the media where the user can generate the data and put it online and read someone else's data. So it's a many to many process, very much close to the social media concept. The wiki is a it's a web page in which many people can get involved doing the writing and acting together. And you saw the camping trip use of the wiki. And we also talk about the RSS, a very simple uh, script <coughs> which you do not need to go ahead to go to different places to collect your data, but they are sent to you directly. But what about photo sharing, podcasting? These are also applications in the web tools you can use to put your photos online, store it in the cloud, and get it anywhere you want. Podcasting is a concept very much similar to RSS, but it's basically a sound audio right, which will be available to you if you register your need for it. Okay? And then, last week, we also introduced to you the ideas of refractive learning. Asking you to reflect on the experience of using something as the basis for you to understand how much you use them, you learn them. Okay, so this week um, we would like you to review the social bookmarking, the social media, and the social networking applications. Um, interestingly speaking, they look very much close to each other. We are going to start with the social media. Okay, to see how close they are to what we have been talking about in the context of brain papers. Okay, social media. I'm sure you've heard the buzz. Social media may be the next big thing. What's it all about? This is social media in plain English. Let's take a visit to Scoopville, a town that's famous for ice cream. For over 20 years, Big Ice Cream Company has been making high quality ice cream with a big factory in town. A few years back, the company did focus groups and found out that they could maximize profits by offering three flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. The residents of the town were content. They never thought it could be different. Then something happened in Scoopville. A new invention came to town. Suddenly, everyone can make their own ice cream for only a few dollars. This changed everything. The Smiths decided to make pineapple ice cream. The Joneses made ice cream with pecans. Soon, every kind of ice cream imaginable was being made by Scoopville's residents at very little cost. Of course, some ice cream was more popular than others, and that was okay. Sylvia's pickle ice cream had a very small but loyal following. That was fine. She only needed enough income to buy ingredients for her next batch. Jarrett's red velvet ice cream became so famous, he created his own store. Over time, people started to think differently about ice cream. It didn't always come from a factory. It also came from friends and neighbors. Wait, what is ice cream making in a particular town to do with social media? Why are they talking about ice cream making? Okay, originally speaking, the town sells three at a time ice cream a day. Anita? What kind of ice cream? free ice cream. And then it turns out that everybody in the town could make ice cream of the whole. So what does ice cream to do with social media? Now you need to ask these questions. It became something to share, something to bring people together, something to celebrate. Right. Big ice cream companies still made the best vanilla around. And to their surprise, demand even grew but it was the unique, original, and authentic flavors made by the residents that brought people to Scoopville. Okay. When they arrived, however, there seemed to be a problem. There were too many flavors. Visitors felt overwhelmed. They needed ways to find the new, the popular, the flavors that were interesting to them. Franklin had an idea for his ice cream. Outside his house, he erected a board and invited his customers to share their thoughts on his ice cream. They could use words to describe it, stars to rate it, and leave messages for others. 
People loved it. At a glance, visitors could tell what his ice cream was all about and learn from people like them. Over time, each resident had their own board. Sylvia's board showed that her pickle ice cream didn't please everyone, but was very unique and interesting. Jared's board overflowed with positive reviews and ratings. Soon, a few things became clear. First, their ice cream got better because they could learn directly from customers. Second, free customer reviews were more valuable than costly advertising. And third, the board created a way for customers to find exactly what they wanted. The combination of new technology and new ways to work with customers helped the residents feel like a unique community. So, this is social ice cream, by the people, for the people. It turns out that ice cream and social media have a lot in common. Today, everyone has a chance to make their own flavors, thanks to free tools like blogs, podcasts, and video sharing. Plus, we now have new ways for real people to play a role in providing feedback, organization, and promotion. Whether you're a big, established company, an individual with loyal fans, or simply someone with ideas and opinions, social media means new opportunities to create and communicate with people that care. New tools are arriving in cities and towns around the world. When this change comes to your neighborhood, the choice is yours. What flavors will you make? I'm Leila Fever, and this has been Social Media in Plain English at commoncraft.com slash store. Okay, I want you to have a three minutes discussions on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. before we go to social networking. What does ice cream to do with social media? Can you tell the story? Can you tell us the stories about studying ice cream that we could have social media which turns the tongues over? Okay? Now you have uh, three minutes to five minutes to make sure you understand the idea behind it before we go to social networking. Did you hear the story? So if it is not ice cream, what could be the replacement? If it's not ice cream, what could be the replacement? Why does ice cream have something to do with social media? So if it is not ice cream, could that be iPhone? Could the iPhone be the ice cream of social media? Yes. In what sense do you need to tell the story? You need to tell. Basically, I'm using this episode to tell the stories of table of tables of students talking and learning. Now think about this. Do you understand why ice cream is important? And what makes the ice cream discussion is important? Okay? I can see that the bad man. This is lady. So okay. I have to do our first explanation. You are the only gentleman here. You can hear It's very interesting. You have to understand this. It starts with a very simple story of ice cream making of productions of cells in a small town. Originally speaking, only three kinds of ice creams. And then, what makes a difference? All in a sudden, everybody in the town is given the ability to produce these own ice cream of choice. And then people have the ability to make ice cream. So, do they need to go back to buy the original ice cream? Well, principally speaking, it does not have any comfort. But, we are at these point, people create ice creams. What makes it happen? And how do people communicate with one another the special brand of ice creams at the ease of their own production? What tools they use? What methods do they use? And are those tools and methods very much consistent with what we are using today? <coughs> so, so media. Okay. Networks get things done. Whether it's sending a letter or writing your home, networks make it happen. To get from Chicago to Santa Fe, we need to see the network of roads that will get us there. We see that Chicago is connected to St. Louis, which is connected to Dallas, which is connected to Santa Fe. Of course, 
people networks can help us with finding jobs, meeting new friends, and finding partners. You know how it works. Bob is your friend, and he knows Sally, and Sally's friend Joe has a job for you. This is a network of people, a social network. Yay! The problem with social networks in the real world is that most of the connections between people are hidden. Your network may have huge potential, but it's only as valuable as the people and the connections that you can see. Boo! This problem is being solved by a type of website called a social networking site. These websites help you see connections that are hidden in the real world. Here's how it works. You sign up for a free account and fill out your profile. Then you look for people you know. When you find someone, you click a button that says add as friend. Once you do this, you and that person have a connection on the website that others can see. What can you tell me? What applications have you used so far which will bring you to your pictures like this? What applications we use or have you used so far which will bring you to something like this? Do you remember during the days of the Hurricane Hato after it, I used a social media called Facebook? to produce information for you. So what is Facebook? Okay, so you can see... They are a member of your network and you are a member of theirs. What's really cool is that you can see who your friends know and who your friends' friends know. You're no longer a stranger, so you can contact them more easily. This solves a real world problem because you're... I do not know as much as my friends know and my friends do not know as much as their friends know. So if I would like to know as much as what my friends know, so I use a social networking software to collect my friends together. So every day when I visit my social networking page, I could have the knowledge of all of my friends. They're contributing the knowledge to me and the knowledge in the context of people network of the social media software, it's an explicit network. Similarly speaking, I'm not the only one who benefit from the network. My friend will also benefit from it because they will benefit from my network. And everybody in the network will benefit from one another. Okay? So you can see that. Your network has hidden opportunities. Social networking sites make these connections between people visible. Like a map for a highway, they show you the people network that can help you get to your next destination, whether it's a job, a new partner, or a great place to live. Your network is suddenly more useful. You can get started at these sites, LinkedIn, Facebook, and MySpace. I use Facebook more than I use LinkedIn. I've never used MySpace, maybe even in North America. So having said things like this, I would like to bring you to your a very useful set of resources on understanding the intellect. Okay, that is set on day number 12 on this first day, but I would like to make sure you're being aware of this because I'm going to tell you that this is a wonderful documentary to bring you from the beginning of the World Wide Web to where we are today. So let's go for part one. to look back to where we are today. What will we remember? 
by those people 1,000 years later on where we are. And so he flipped the chart. Do you know what that could be? Is it a piece of bad? But the answer is the world wide web browser. That is very critical. An amazing and surreal universe that spawned huge fortunes, upended countless industries, and changed the way that much of the world works, plays, communicates, shops, and even falls in love. My name's John Howard. I'm here to tell you the story of the web's rise from obscurity to global ubiquity. It's a tale I know like the back of my hand. Because as a journalist, I had a ringside seat for the whole shebang. For more than a decade, I was right here in Silicon Valley, witnessing up close the moments that shaped the internet age. That age began with a vicious power struggle to decide who would control the future of the just emerging web. Jim Clark starts running around the table like something. I can see politics take a public right now. Close and true. I have made 653 million. A struggle that would end with an epic courtroom battle. I have no idea what you're talking about. And that would forever be remembered as the browser war for the future of the just emerging web. Jim Clark starts running around the table and he's like, we have to take this thing public, we have to take a public right now. Boys are trading. I have made 662 million. A struggle that would end with an epic courtroom battle. I have no Do you know who this guy is? You should know who he is. He's Bill Gates. And who is Bill Gates? It's the inventor of Microsoft software, inventor? No. He's the founder of the Microsoft company, yes, that's much more better. So what he did at that time, about 15 to 20 years ago, in the 19, no, it's more than 15 to 20 years, it's 23 years ago, I guess. He's in a courtroom, arguing for something, arguing for perhaps the way he packaged the browser together with the operating system. Because the way the Microsoft company at that time would like to do is that if you want to go online, you must use our product. We cannot use any other browser. In other words, if you use my operating system, the only thing you use is the browser we provide. Is it reasonable? Okay. Fortunately, he lost the battle. Okay? So today, we still have and I'll never be remembered as the browser world. We were like a game, and I like Microsoft in front of us, so what do we do, what do we do? We us. All hands on deck. This is not a trick. We're going to crush this, we're going to crush this. We have to destroy this code. Okay, it's a very interesting document. The amazing tale of how the internet took over the world begins with the overfertile imaginations of a group of kennels, mini golf loving undergraduate computer nerds from the University of Illinois. I believe in a strange new unexplored space. What's called cyberspace. Back in 1993, these guys were fascinated by an obscure scientific research network called the World Wide Web, invented in 1989 by an English scientist called Tim Berners-Lee. Having grown up with this kind of technology at our fingertips, it was partially imagination at all. And you would talk to the average girl on the street, they would have no idea. Because it's one of these technologies that you don't know you need until you start using it. At today, we're all used to the web with its fancy video and graphics and sound. But one mouse click can send us rolling down a path. Who wants to know like that? But back then, the web was very different. There are precious few web pages, and they consisted of nothing but line after line of boring text. There was hardly anything worth finding, and no way to find it anyway. You have to be a big time geek to get all excited about this thing. But one of those geeks, a visionary University of Illinois computer science student named Mark Andreessen, had a crazy idea. He imagined a future where everyone, including regular people like you and me, would use the web as part of our daily lives. Do you see the significance? of this statement when that particular software developer called Mark Anderson visualized that one day every one of us is going to use the browser every day, every <coughs> seconds of our life with no long interruptions. Are we doing something like this now? Look at the people with the, with the mobile devices now, even in class, 
You are not disconnected anymore. What he said is correct. Okay, this is a lifestyle predicted about 20 some years ago by that program. But at that time, people believed that he's crazy. Alright? Do you see the meaning of that? The impact? Information technology and you. And now when we look back, it is such a fascinating journey. And Grace had a cubicle near me and he was working on a different product and then he got all wild eyed about this thing uh, called the web. The internet at that point was really only for parents, it was really only for academics and researchers and scientists and, and, and there wasn't any. Do you recognize this name, Mosaic? When you have time after school, look at this work using Google. This is the name of the web, wild web browser we used back in 1993. 1995. And he is that engineer who visualized that someday we're going to use a browser every time of our lives. Okay? Alright, so allow me some time to take uh, attendance with you. Now promise me, before you come back on Thursday, these four part series on the true story of the internet, enjoy yourself at home. Okay? It's just about 50, 50 minutes each, but you can have a very good understanding of the development of the internet from the browser wars to the people involved to the development. Okay? It's a very good piece. Make sure you enjoy it. I do not say we study it, we just read and watch it. It's very exciting. Okay? Now allow me to take attendance before we come back with something much more important. Tira, thank you. Wing Chen, Wing Chen, Natia, Rowena, thank you. Uh, Gang Ying, Gang Ying, Gang Ying, Chen, Gang Ying, Jack, okay, okay, next time. Isabella, thank you. Uh, Ruby Chung, thank you. Stephen Chung, Thank you. Melo Chiu. Melo. Thank you. And then Yuki Deng. Yuki. Thank you. Amelia. Thank you. Angel Fu. Thank you. Um, I Squawk. Thank you. Uh, Judy Ho. Judy. Judy. Thank you. Kelly Ho. Thank you. Anthony Ho, thank you. Happy Hoy, thank you. Wing Tong, Wing Tong, thank you. Kai Yu, thank you. Coco, thank you, Coco. Thank you, thank you. Jerry Yim, thank you. Oliver Ken, Oliver, thank you. Sabrina, not here today. Charlie Lamb, thank you. Pinky Lamb, thank you. Ho Yin, Ho Yin, Ho Yin. You're not here today. Okay, safe attendance. All right, Mooki Lamb, thank you. Make it, thank you. Ask me Lamb. Thank you. Wei Yang Long. Thank you. Garmin Lei. Thank you. Bobo Lei. Thank you. Winnie Lei. Thank you. Ron Lei. Thank you. Jeremy Lerm. Thank you. Hoi Ting. Thank you. Kathy Lerm. Thank you. David, learn. David, thank you. Azuri Lee, thank you. Life Lee, nice, thank you. Go from the other, thank you. Logan Lee, thank you. Jamie New, thank you. Bring Low, thank you. T. Yun, thank you. Fry Pie, thank you. Eric 
you. Thank you. Dick O. Thank you. Big T Pen. Thank you. Celia Sin. Thank you. Gideon Sun. Thank you. Okay, one last. Ho Yi Su. Thank you. Rekana Ten. Thank you. Whitney Ten. Whitney. Thank you. Alisa Trey. Thank you. T. Lee. Thank you. Anna Bowl. Thank you. Tony Bowl. Thank you. Fred Bowl. Fred. Not yet. Stanley Wing. Thank you. Nia Bowl. Jason Walsh, Helen Walsh, Helen, Helen, Martin, Lakita, thank you, Michael Sio, Michael, thank you, Jerry C, Jerry C, not here today, Sandy C, thank you, Bruce Sue. Nick Zhu, thank you. Bobby Yong, thank you. Yuan Yuan thank you. Thank you. Hip Notes, thank you. Drew, Drew, Drew is not here today. Okay. All right. Sylvia, thank you. Okay, last. Susie, thank you. Very good. Finish attendance score in about seven minutes. So let's get back to something very important. Last week we introduced to you Microsoft PowerPoint with voice over each slide. We invite you and your partner to participate in exploring how you can acquire the skill of producing your own PowerPoint. Record your voice over each slide of the PowerPoint and finally convert the voice over PowerPoint into a video file. Now, we hope some of you in this classroom have already acquired a skill, and if you know who have done this, you better go and ask them. They helped you. This week, we would like to introduce to you something about the Google tools. And we would like to start with a very important tools called the Google Classroom. Because you can use it to create a very good site to collaborate with other people. So let's start with a couple of minutes on the Google side, a uh, Google Classroom. Google Classroom has been opened up to private Gmail accounts. Let's have a look at what that means for you. This is another flipped classroom tutorials. That's right, we can all access Google Classroom and create courses now. Simply search to classroom.google.com and you will be taken to the home page of Google Classroom. Now, Google Classroom has been a very powerful platform used by educational domains to create courses, communicate, save time, stay organized, send out homework tasks and so much more. Guess what? It's open to private accounts now. So let's go ahead and select our account, click on continue. And we can now create or join our first class free of charge. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's click on the plus icon and let's create our own class. Obviously, it says you need to sign up for free educational. Now, I want to use this as a private person. So I'm going to click on continue and I'm going to create my class. Now, my class name will be course. Google Docs for beginners. Now what sort of section I'm going to leave that blank. The subject will be on G Suite for education. Now this is how you can build your class. Let's create this. And there we go. We are now inside our online presence for the course Google Docs for beginners. Now me as a course facilitator, I can add students, I can add information, I can have homework tasks, and I can add topics within Google Docs for Beginners. Now before we have a look at this communication, what we are going to do is we are going to create our very first post. Now the way we're going to do that 
is by first of all creating a topic within my course and then we're going to add a post to that topic. And the first topic will be creating a document we're going to add this topic. We're also going to add a second topic which we will look at later and it's going to be sharing a document. And this is how you can start structuring your course. Now you can see I have two topics here, I can rename those topics, or I can delete these topics. I'm going to delete them here, I'm going to select the first one, which is creating a document. Now as you can see, there are no posts, so I'm going to click on the plus icon, and I'm going to create an announcement within this topic. So let's go ahead and do that. Hello everyone, welcome to the first topic within our Google Docs for Beginners course. Brilliant, so we now have our first post. And what I can do is I can add some attachments. I can add a file from my personal drive, a YouTube video, or a link. And seeing as this is a standard announcement, I'm going to leave it as is. And I'm going to schedule this, or save it as a draft. And I'm going to schedule it to be posted tomorrow. So let's go ahead and select tomorrow. Uh, there we go. And we are going to schedule it. Now, seeing as this post has been scheduled, I can view it up here, but none of my students will see this until the post date of May the 2nd at 8 a.m. in the morning. I can add a second post. And I'm going to say, please watch the first video in our course. And I'm going to add a YouTube video now. I'm going to click on the YouTube icon and this will bring me to a video search. Or I can simply use the YouTube URL if I have that URL. Now I'm going to do a quick Google search on YouTube for my own video. Dog Beginners. I think it's called Basics. And there it is. Learn the basics at this video. Okay, this has been added. And I'm going to post this again and I'll schedule it to be posted <coughs> about an hour after the original welcome post. I'll schedule that. And there we go. So these are two posts that are scheduled to be sent out to my students. Now when I go to students, obviously I would like to invite some students. Now you can simply invite students by sending them an email or you can share this class code right here with your students. Now this is where you can start creating courses which are invite only. So what you would do is you would share either this code with a select group of people or you make this code freely available for people to join. Now having Google Classroom available to private Google accounts means that you as an educator can use your educational domain to create courses to create training sessions and share these codes with people who do not have access to your training domain. Now, I want to go back to my stream and I want to sort of clean up my classroom a little bit. I want to make it look a bit more exciting. So I'm going to click on upload a photo and I'm going to select a photograph to use as my wallpaper. Now, once the image has been uploaded, you are going to be prompted to crop this image. So I'm going to crop it, I'm going to just enlarge this bit. I'm going to use the top bit of this image. Select class theme. There we go, the top will change to my own personal theme. And this can be anything you want it to be. Right, so look at the next bit. That's no work due soon. I guess you understand the power of this tool, would you? Because with a group of students, that you become the leader of that group. You can easily create an environment with that and invite the group member to get into to manage your group work, to keep track of the things you are doing. Now, since this is Google tools, it's very, very much more powerful than the Google environment here. Okay, it's a principle. It's you have your control. You need to be your own administrator. Okay, that is a very important thing. Trust me, spend time reading the rest of the video, just seven minutes, and get started with your learning problem. This is the second IT skill you need to get yourself equipped.
Okay, last week, how to make digital story with a generated PowerPoint. This week, how to create a working site about your own members with the Google Plus. As long as you have a Google account, you can start using it. Okay? It is only in this year that this Google Classroom is made available to individual private users. Curiously, it is only available to schools. Okay? If you do not affiliate with a particular school, you cannot use it. But now it's too. So it's very useful. Make sure you stop learning it. Alright, that's it for today. I'm going to see you back here on Thursday for something much more important. Alright? If you have questions, you can stay behind and ask me. But remember, I told you at the very beginning of today's class, this is week number six, topic online discussion forum. Inside this forum, I produce an important friend called resubmission of your first journal. If you believe you have not done a good job in your first submissions and you have already produced a wrong name, you need to come here. Click the reply button, resubmit your file with the correct name by putting it in the box there and save and pose it, okay? Put it here and pose the form. That's it to resubmit your journal. If you have not submitted yet, you must do this before 11.55 tonight, okay? If you do it beyond 11.55 tonight, you will be cut as late, okay? Have a good day and see you back here on Thursday. Bye-bye.